time I can. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Todd has started the recording. And so we are at item not eight three point one. Uh, I think I have an old anyhow, Todd, take it away. It's gonna be me. Oh Mark, sorry. Yes, Mark. That's all right. I was waiting for Todd to speak up and just take the lead on it. It's all good. Um, Todd, I guess I have to ask, has anybody joined us from the live stream that you might recognize a number with or anything? No, nobody has. Okay, so um, I'm of the understanding that our one o'clock delegation has uh, a personal appointment that they're attending and not going to be attend. Um, there have been a couple other things added in under this 8.3. Um, so in the absence of uh, our one o'clock delegation attendee, um, there is a request for decision in front of council regarding a license agreement for the applicant. Um, I'd like to review some history with council on that first that uh, I was contacted by the applicant on April 12th requesting a license, acknowledging the process the County Council and administration have in place for um, proceeding under the bylaw to acquire the license to um, clean out a roadside ditch where soil erosion had accumulated adjacent to their farm field. Uh, at that time, I advised that I had a meeting scheduled later on with the committee to uh, review the uh, draft license agreement, ensure we had all of our bases covered, that things were being um, done in a legitimate way and that the county was protected um, from liability for their actions within the road ditch with other terms and conditions. Um, and I contacted that applicant following that meeting uh, and had to leave a voicemail that day. Uh, the following day, April 13th, I was contacted by the applicant. He advised he would be in to sign the application that day in order for it to be in front of council and reviewed here today at this meeting. Um, at the end of the week, I touched base with the executive assistant, was advised that the applicant had not been in to sign the application or to review the terms and conditions under the application that we had provided. So I set a reminder for Monday, April 19th to give the applicant a call to reassure them that we want to do our best to get this before council, get what they need so they can do what they need on adjacent to their property um, as the county is not in a position to move on that yet. So I called on the Monday, left the voicemail. The applicant actually came into the office about half an hour later. Um, I met the applicant at the front counter and uh, was uh, advised that there was no need to complete the application nor submit it because the work had been carried out and is complete. And I said, well, you understood the advertisement because you acknowledged that you understood the public education campaign that we did on social media uh, prior to April 12th, which is why you reached out to me. You've proceeded with the work without any authorization. Well, we did the Alberta One Call Locates. Uh, Tyrol Gas came out, located the gas pipeline. We didn't have time to wait for anyone or anything else, so we cleaned it up. Well, funny enough, there's overhead power lines in, in immediate uh, vicinity to uh, that roadside ditch, and uh, I'm sure there's probably a few other utilities buried there as well. Um, anyway, the uh, I did ask the applicant to print, sign, and date the application. Um, I kind of uh, disregarded the need for reviewing all of the terms and conditions of the agreement, which are all included in your uh, council agenda package. And uh, they scratched out that they, they took this work upon themselves, so the uh, owner operator wasn't uh, utilized either. And, um, I more or less just collected the signature so that council had something to consider. However, at this time, I would like to amend my RFD uh, recommended action because the work is done. 
I don't believe council should grant a license application in this uh, or a license agreement in this matter because the work proceeded without any knowledge to the county. And I can advise county council that municipal enforcement has gone out and served a $250 ticket to the individual for failing to abide by the bylaw, which uh, is really what we discussed at our last council meeting. If we found people um, doing things um, to make them aware, to get them to cease work, and in our opinion, this applicant was fully aware from April 12th moving forward, the panic was set in to get their application in. We worked diligently to get that turnaround in a timely manner. The only reason the application was coming before council is because that is exactly how the bylaw is written, is it requires council uh, approval through resolution. And that is where we are at today. So at this time, I, I guess this request for decision is actually kind of a, a mute point in all of this but I wanted to bring that matter to council's attention. I'm willing to discuss anything you have for questions. Brian, Hubie. You, I, I'm gonna ask you, a, I'll give you a hypothetical situation. I don't know if you have the answer to it or not, but I'm curious. So let's say somebody is out there and our fears are realized and he hits a fiber optic cable that I've, I've heard that those can be in excess of $100,000 to be re repaired. Who pays? If he's done this, if the individual that's done this has done it without our license and without our agreement. I've read through the license that you have highlighted there and it, look, it seems like a contractor that's, that would be required to do it has the amount of liability insurance to cover that. But in the event of uh, somebody proceeding without the authorization to do it, Who's on the hook? It's our. It's in our right away. It's a, a utility. Who who covers that cost? Because that could bankrupt I, some people. Yeah, um, and and that's why we wanted to ensure that this was done in the most appropriate manner with people and companies that would have that insurance in place in the event something happened, which is also why uh, the requirement to have the Alberta One Call placed and have all the utilities located before work happened. Uh, if something would have happened in this situation, uh, Councillor DeJong, um, best I can say is that utility company would have to attempt to seek out who actually did the damage and try to pursue that through illegal means. Uh, if there's no concrete evidence as to who did that, uh, I, I think it would be unfortunate for the utility company and anybody else impacted uh, due to that outage. Uh, I, I don't know what recourse they really have with things and, and maybe, um, you know, more or less in, in even issuing of the uh, infraction and, and admission of guilt is 100% is um, gonna come back on you, right? And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what the recourse truly would be. It, it's almost no different than if somebody runs over over a TELUS pedestal because they lost control on the road, yet they still have their vehicle in a in a complete mobile manner and, and they drive away from, from the situation and never report it. Um, how far down the rabbit hole do these utility companies go before they get out, repair it, and have it as a write-off? Unfortunately. Yeah, I guess my question was, you, thank you for your answer. I think you've answered it. I guess I was just looking for if there was any uh, possibility that the county would be liable because it's in our right of way in that circumstance. I, I, I don't believe we would be. Um, we, we allow them to be in our road allowances and uh, really the, the care and maintenance of their infrastructure is up to them. Any, any repairs or work of things, um, you know, not going in and tinkering with the TELUS pedestal or anything, but work that they actually do in those road allowances is supposed to be coordinated through our office so that we are aware of their activities as well, particularly installation or removal of utilities. So uh, I, I don't I don't think there should be any recourse on us, but I can't say for sure that there wouldn't be. Hubie. Thanks, Mark. I agree with Councillor Dijon. Um, Mr. Dovachuk, he's, 
He said he's done this, cleaned this ditch out since 1971, whenever he had erosion. So he thought he could just go ahead and do this and get a contractor and clean it out. They placed the machine on the land side, not on the road. So they thought they were in the right of way to go do what they want. And then of course the power line, they, they taped everything off and uh, the operator was warned about the power lines, but they still went ahead. And by the time everybody got to have a look, everything was done. He just went right ahead with it. He, he got kind of impatient and uh, Mr. Dovachuk didn't want to wait for bad weather and his field would start flooding and the, the drain ditch would fill up and he couldn't get the drainage off because the drainage culverts were all plugged up and he wanted to get that cleaned out. So he, he went right ahead and, and like uh, Mark said, our enforcement officer came out and gave him the minimum ticket and he said, yes, I was in the wrong and I'll accept the consequences. Any other questions? Wayne? A land erosion from his land? Or was it from a neighbor or something? From his land. His land, yeah. And this has happened before and he hasn't got solved the problem? This isn't good. Kelly? Mark, how old is the bylaw that we're referencing? Because a two hundred and fifty dollar <clears throat> fine is pretty minimal for something uh, this catastrophic. Last time this bylaw was looked at is, uh, I believe that number is two thousand eleven. If Ariana cares to correct me on that, the last two digits refer to the year it was looked at. And I, I'll be I'll be honest to carry on with that discussion. Um, in the in the in the little more than a decade that I've been here, we we've actually been challenged um, to impose stiffer fines because we've been on more of an educational side of things than than an enforcement side of things. And um, even when a court finds something unreasonable, um, the the fines come into questions. So. You're, you're trying to look at what fines other municipalities have in place and trying to find things in the same kind of kind of realm of things because people have been in and tested those waters with the courts and stuff before right so that's that's really where those things come from um i, I think that soils conservation act had definitely more significant uh values that uh, could be sought after in that but uh because this was unauthorized activity in the road allowance, that's how the bylaw is written right now. So Mark, this is basically here for our information? Well, originally it was here because the applicant was seeking council's uh, approval of the license agreement. However, due to knowledge found out earlier this week of the work being undertaken, I thought it should stay here and council have this discussion with administration to uh, A, make all of council aware, um, B, let any and all of our public know that it's public record that people have proceeded and, and fines have been issued and um, C, that there is a process and we're going through that process as council has directed um, where people are not communicating with our offices and it's negligent on their part and, and stuff to the process, uh, they, they should be ticketed. Uh, the admission to myself right out of the gate on April 12th was, I've read that I'm not supposed to be there. I want to apply for my license. I did all the work. I got the RFD and everything into Ariana on time and the, uh, they had the work done last week. It isn't even as, as if it took place this week, just yesterday and in prior to this meeting, it was done last week. So they didn't even wait three days from engaging the office. Okay, so moving on, we have a legit, legitimate application now. And you referenced getting a, the committee in place. Is it, uh, is there a committee in place already? Or maybe I heard wrong. 
Um, no, for for this for this second um, request for decision, it's actually uh, an application from S and K Farms uh, right. for land adjacent to Range Road 15.5, which is just on the north side of Scandia, for quarter section 30.15.15 west of the fourth. Um, they do want to proceed with acquiring a, a license agreement from council to be able to um, retain the services of Second Chance Limited to go in and clean out that roadside ditch. And with that, um, Second Chance Limited is a contractor that the county's used in the past. We do believe that they provide excellent workmanship and that they are a trustworthy source. They have the uh, insurances in place because they work for us to fulfill the terms and conditions of the um, agreement. And uh, with that, due to the bylaw reading, the council must provide um, resolution for uh, approval on this. Uh, it is before you to um, consider and approve or reject. Any questions, Brian? Not a question, a motion to approve this, uh, this uh, license. And um, I'll reserve my comments after we vote, but I have another another uh, comment after we vote, please, uh, Madam Reed. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Brian. Okay, um, so I guess I, I look at this and I wonder why we're going to see these at council. I, I uh, to me they fit into the same category as a development permit that that we look at that we have our development officer approve. Um, we have like I rely on Mark, Jeff, and Terry and Todd to evaluate these as they come in. And you guys, uh, I'm speaking to you, you guys have way more knowledge about the ramifications and the proximity to these things than I as a counselor do. And I can understand where somebody wants to get stuff done. It could depend on weather and to have to wait for a two week period, it could be up to two weeks before council sees them, I think is really slowing down the process. This is a good thing that people want to get that topsoil out. So they, you know, they screwed up. Okay, so, so be it. But let's get if they're if they're willing to look at the remediation and to be able to follow all the rules that are that we've put in place as far as to to have a legitimate contractor in there doing the work properly, then I think we should have a have a way that they can accelerate this. They can bring an application or through a phone call or through something, um, bring it to our staff. Our staff can look at it. They'll understand it, and 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 short circuit the situation so that. We don't have uh, uh, the one applicant that went ahead and did it by himself. I, I don't have sympathy for him, but I can also understand where he had somebody that could get a, get a crew in, in order and was going to go out there and get it done. So that's my thinking, and maybe maybe I'm out to lunch, but I just think that um, having our staff be able to have eyes on this and the ability to approve these makes a lot more sense than having to wait two weeks before we see it at council. Mark? Yeah, just in response to that, the way that the bylaw is currently written is the terms and conditions that administration is playing within. So if council is providing that direction to get into the bylaw to revise that language, we will bring it back to you for your first meeting in May with the correction to that language authorizing uh, the CAO and or designate to um, remove this process from council. Do we need a motion to do that or just direction good enough? I think directions is good enough given this circumstance. Let's play it safe and make that a, a motion, Brian. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I have no problem with that. Um, uh, to so the motion would be to bring back the bylaw for uh, revision to um, to look at it as from direction council. 
to make the changes, the amendments involving staff. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank Mark, you. do you have other stuff in here today? Uh, yeah, well? I do have a few other items in here. I just don't know whether you'd like to proceed with them now or get back to your regular agenda. Uh, well, I do remember that Shannon and Stephanie, we're coming back for some things. So maybe we will wait uh, year round, Mark. All good. Okay. Usually All listening. Right. Okay, well, we'll go back instead to where we left off at the start of our agenda, which is the bylaws 7.1, uh, the tax penalties and incentives. Shannon, is that you? There you are. Hi, so we did first reading on the tax penalties and incentives, and I am looking for second and third today. Um, we allowed a gap for public um, uh, response. Um, I did not receive any, so I have no amendments or anything other to add. Thank you. We have a motion for second reading. Wayne? Wayne moves second reading. All in favor? Opposed? And for third reading, Hubie moves. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. And then moving on to the tax rates. Uh, Basically the same same uh, deal. We passed first reading last meeting. So we're just on to second and third readings today, right? Yes, please. Who would like to move second reading? Anne-Marie will. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. And for third and final reading, Lionel moves. All in favor? Pose, that motion is also carried. That's it for you, Shannon. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, well, that takes us to the item 7.3, recreation areas, establishment. And uh, I think the only thing that might have changed, Lane, was uh, the map revision a little bit. Right, with the exception of one boundary line between the Brooks Rural area and the Tilly area, the recreation areas have conformed or been consistent with the electoral divisions. Uh, when we drilled into this one in further detail, it became evident that there is a, the top one third of Township 17-14 is actually been excluded from the Tilly Recreation Area and has been included all along in the Division 510 Recreation Area. What we're asking for from Council today is second reading as amended followed by third reading. Clarence? One question, and I, and I think I know where the northern boundary of the Rolling Hills area is, but I had trouble making sure that I was I was reading it right. But that is when you're you're west of going west of eight uh, eight seventy five. That's um, that's on that spill ditch where the spill ditch is. Does anybody know? I think that's where it is, but. The boundary between the Tilly, Tilly area and Rolling Hills area cuts right through the center of those townships. Right. We would have to drill into the actual map to determine which township yeah, over here was. And I, I tried to do it by where, where it looked like there was quarter sections and I, and I couldn't really make it work, but 
I just want to make sure that that's where it is. It's always where I thought it was, and I just want to make sure that that's where it's drawn. That's all. There's a main irrigation ditch running east and west there. Um, and that's so, as long as I can remember where the boundaries were. And, but I can't really figure it out by looking at the map for sure. I should be able to, I guess, if I, if it's exactly the middle, it should be easy. But. Is it just a lot of open uh, land, Clarence? No, it, it's, uh, it's, to the south of it, there is a, uh, you know, and that's what got me a little bit, there, there's about, uh, two miles of farms and, and it doesn't look like it where the, the line is drawn and but maybe I should go the other way from the north to make sure it's where it's supposed to be. Lionel? Not on the 535 Clarence. No, it wouldn't be. No, it's not. It's up uh, what we used to call Bantry. Uh, school division was always there. Um, so I'm... It's south of the Rolling Hills Reservoir. That's where the boundary line is. No, it isn't. Isn't it? No, I don't think so. It goes into yeah. the Rolling Hills Reservoir. It cuts right through the Rolling Hills Reservoir. Yeah, if, part of it. if you were to follow 873 right through to Rainier, it's actually just south of that, eight, <clears throat> south of 873 on the south end of Lake Newell. And just head straight east along that road. <clears throat> road 163. Township Road 163. Correct. Okay, that's all I need to know. Just just wanted to make sure it was drawn in the right place. Yeah. All right, any <laughs> other questions? We have a, a motion or a, for second reading then. Tracy moves, or is that a question, Tracy? I think you're moving it. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I moved second. I didn't find my speaker. <laughs> I was trying to read your lips. <laughs> okay, the motion has been made by Tracy for second reading. As, well, as amended. As amended, yes. With that one correction. All in favor? Opposed, motion is carried. And then for third reading, Clarence moves. All in favor? Opposed, motion is carried. All right, that should cover page one of our agenda. Moving on to page two, ag service business and some legislative appointments is next on the agenda then. Todd, this time, I got you the right guy. Thank you so much for having me. It's so <laughs> exciting to talk to you guys today. All right, so, um, uh, first, uh, the first thing, legislative appointments, it's something that we do every year for our weed inspectors and our uh, pest officers for the County of Newell. Um, so that just allows us the opportunity to uh, inspect on private land as we needed and uh, technically enforce the Weed Control Act. Although we don't utilize our weed inspectors to do that, we typically do that from the office um, 
which is is a great way to do it, I think. And we don't uh, submit a lot of those because we find a lot of landowner cooperation. Um, and also the uh, pest officers, the, the weed inspectors are the ones, or the vegetation management technicians, pardon me, are the ones that do our uh, pest surveys. And sometimes our pest surveys will take us into a landowner's field to look for things like Fusarium graminiarum or club root or uh, a host of other other pests. Um, so this just affords them the opportunity to do that um, under the legislation. Now also this time, uh, you'll see this is a little bit different than last year. Um, we do have a third motion uh, that we appoint Tina Taylor as a soil conservation officer. Uh, and that's just for her to be able to do our um, roadside surveys for the erosion ha that happened um, you know, in, in recent month and I guess as it continues, um, but she's been out and we just wanna make sure that if she needs to uh, take a few steps into a field to get a good measurement or a better picture or, or whatever the case may be that she has that opportunity. Uh, so it would just be me and Tina, I believe that are soil conservation officers. I maybe will as well, but I didn't go back to research all of the motions from the past. Um, but yeah, so that's why we wanted to add Tina into that, uh, into that role. <clears throat> so they did start this morning, They, uh, Catherine and her went out and they said 99% of the work uh, will easily be able to be done within the right of way. Um, but this just gives her the opportunity if she has to take those steps out to, to do her job. Excellent. Excellent. Kelly? Uh, motion to approve. Uh, the first one. A point. Do you want them individually? I get, it looks like you want individual motions. So, um, the first motion. First motion is for weed inspector. Weed inspectors. Right. I will make that motion. All in favor. Opposed. Motion is carried. The second motion is for the appointment as inspectors. Re the Ag Pest Act. Hubie will make that motion. I'll make that motion, yeah. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. And the third one is in regards to the Soil Conservation Act, as Todd pointed out. Motion for that one. Ellen moves. All in favor? Opposed, motion is carried. So got those done. So moving on, uh, we have possibility of a team field visit from the Ag people, Todd. Yeah, some of you might remember the last time that Doug came out. Uh, we were in this facility, so it's it's in recent years. Uh, we were able to get together at that time. Um, but we, we had a very quick meeting in the council work room just off chambers. Um, Doug introduced himself. We, uh, we talked about different questions that he had. And then I took Doug and showed him all the wonderful things that we do in our county to keep uh, land productive and weeds at bay and all the rest of that good stuff and the different programming that we offer. Um, so similar thing, um, he wants to do it again. So. At that, the last time we did it, they were uh, they were completing five field visits per year, and I think we have sixty nine rural municipalities that have an egg service board, sixty eight or sixty nine, um, and so now they're doing fifteen per year, which is a considerable jump. So that's probably why we got uh, on top of that list again. So long story short, uh, Doug and his team, or Doug or his team, I guess, want to come down and have a quick visit with us, and then take a tour of our wonderful county with me. And they're looking for a few dates between June and September. And I have no suggestions on dates. So for you then, there's nothing, I mean, with work and holidays and whatever, is there anything that you want to suggest? Oh, Molly, I'm here for you. I'm not here for me. Wow. <laughs> I could respond, but I'll just no. say, wow. 
<laughs> so you just want us to randomly start picking a date. Uh, how about a month, Todd? Is there a month that you could suggest? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, let's do middle of July. That's what I like to hear. Okay, middle of July. We have council meeting on the 8th and the 22nd. Other than that, I probably wasn't paying attention, but do we have to do that with talk? Can't you just take Doug by yourself and show him around? Yes, I'm absolutely going to do that part by myself because that would be, I mean, although it would be great for you guys to see the county uh, as we see it, um, I think just that part, the tour is for sure just me and Doug. But uh, he wants to get together with our Ag Service Board, which is all you guys. And we could do it as a Zoom. Yes, we could. We could even coordinate it an hour before a council meeting as long as we can find a new moderator for that day as well. Are moderators um, hard to find? <laughs> no, they shouldn't be that bad. It's just going to be get Brian out of bed that early. That's all. <laughs> all right. Well, how about the July 8th morning? Do you want to try for that? ahead of the council meeting guys would that work so i've turned my camera off once again because you guys have all turned into sort of like my computer screen's broken um i can't see who has their hand up so July, tell me if July 8th won't work. I see I see a few thumbs distant, okay? So hearing, hearing nothing, I'm going to say that July 8th is okay for everyone. Oh, you're back. I don't see anyone with their hand up. So July 8th and um, is an hour long enough, Todd, do you suppose? Or? Yeah, I think an hour is a long time. <laughs> with us no no not with you guys i just think for what uh, doug wants to discuss with us i think an hour is a is a good chunk of time okay so we'll say nine o'clock asb uh with doug prior to council and uh you know what if if that doesn't work just pick a different one todd with him that's pretty easy if we go with a council meeting does that work for you folks so it can be June, can be whenever. All right. I think we have a good plan in place then. That was Thank easy. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, that was. So that's all for you for now, Todd. All right, we'll move on to item 10, one, renewing the audit services and um stephanie i don't know if she is with us I see her name is there there she is good afternoon stephanie we're at item uh 10 one and uh you can bring it forward yes so i'm here this afternoon uh to ask for council's approval to go ahead and renew the audit services that we have with uh avail llp Charter Professional Accountants. Um, when we went to tender back in 2018, we uh, accepted for three years with the option to renew for an additional two. And so um, with the audit for the year December 31st, 2020, that finalized the first three years. So we're just coming here to see if council would uh, be okay with extending it for another two years uh, with a bail. Would someone like to make a motion or have any comments otherwise? Wayne. Make the motion. All right, 
Wayne is making a motion to proceed with the extension to the bail um, contract. Discussion, comments, all in favor? Opposed, motion is carried. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you very much. How are things going? Very good, very good. How about you guys? Good, good. Glad to hear that you're enjoying your uh, new position. So far, so good. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to requests for support regarding the census. Um, item 10-2. And I guess this was uh, me that suggested that they wanted the, I can't remember this even, it's so long ago, but they wanted to have support for the idea of um, conducting a federal census this year. And this was sent out in January. I wonder if there was a thought that, um, we would be more normalized by now. I'm just, I don't know. And I can't remember, do you suppose? Yeah, I don't know. They're hiring 32,000 people to wander around. So I certainly hope COVID slows down before then. Brian. Well, then, you know, I guess when they say you're hiring 32,000 people, and I know the bureaucracy is pretty pretty heavy at the top, but I can't help but wonder why they couldn't accept our census data from what we did within the last year. It must be completely relevant. And, uh, you know, with the county, we did our own census prior to the electoral boundaries thing. So, like, am I just out to lunch, or is that something that we could propose that, rather than them hiring census people to do something that's been done within the last, you know, basically the last six months or eight months, it would be seem sort of logical just to take that data. But hey, that's big government. Yeah, and I'll, I'll defer to perhaps to Lane because um, I'm just thinking that sometimes um, the census from the uh, government of Canada is different than what we would do locally. The information they gather, perhaps? The, the census is, is conducted by Statistics Canada, and it is part of a nationwide process that they go through on regular cycles. They have very um, prescribed processes that they put in place. Their census areas are also different than what the counties are. Um, really, there isn't any choice in this matter. The census is proceeding regardless of what a local municipality may or may not want to have happen. Um, it is completely under the control of, of Stats Canada. Really, what they're looking for is just support in increasing awareness of the initiative. Uh, if there's an opportunity for the county to make information available to the public so that the public is fully aware of the fact that the federal census is going ahead this year. I think that's really what they're looking for. And I, the resolution asks um, us so that it encourages our residents to complete their census questionnaire online. So I'm not sure what the 32,000 people, I guess assist to assist, but yeah, I don't know. Up to you guys. Kelly. Um, I'll make a motion um, to do as requested. I do have a question though. Um, did you just find this in your inbox dated January 31st, 13th or how did this happen? <laughs> Ariana, help. <laughs> I did forward it right after January 13th and was um, given direction yeah. to hold on to it and bring it to a council meeting closer to when the census actually starts. 
because uh, they had they have been advertising and I think advertisements have closed for the positions so um, some of this information is old now but um, yeah motion to approve support the 2021 federal census see how I could put off things I just tell Ariana to bring it back but she actually does it <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ariana. All right, all in favor of the motion? <laughs> Opposed? Motion is carried. As, um, assessment model changes. I think you've all been updated on that one. From our last week's meeting, councillor payment sheets. Any questions? Otherwise, we need a motion to accept. Anne-Marie moves. Yep. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Payment register for council. Any questions on that? A motion to accept the payment register as process there. Clarence moves. All in favor? Oh, Lionel, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Um, the Palliser, Pal Palliser Air Shed, I didn't, society, I didn't know what that was. For $632. I'm predicting that would be maybe our membership. It is a thing, a place that operates out of, um, it's just what it says. <laughs> Except they're, I believe they're moving, putting another site up in our region shortly. I'm not sure, I forget. Lane? I recall that the, this organization actually made a presentation during one of the Foothills Little Bowl meetings here a couple of years ago, and they are a monitor, an air quality monitoring group throughout Southern Alberta. And I, Lionel, um, I sat in on their AGM in a few months ago, anyhow. They're, they're a sort of an under-the-radar organization, but they do, uh, yeah, they monitor the quality of our air. I can get you more information if you want. Okay, thank you. No, it's Clarence, not necessary. Thank you. Clarence made the motion, and I think we did accept it before I noticed line, Lionel's hand, but all in favor of the motion? Opposed? Okay, the payment register has been accepted. Functions of council? All right, we're at Mark again for municipal services business and a request for proclamation for National Public Works Week, which we have done other years. I don't think it needs a lot of explanation. Does someone want to make a motion? Hubie will make a motion for that, for the proclamation. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, Mark? I'm here. <clears throat> Request for decision in front of council here for the Alberta Motor Association Rural Road Sign Program. Um, this will bring back some old memories for some of you that are still with us. Uh, from the 2009 period, um, there, there are still signs from the AMA out there throughout the county of Newell. Um, I think I've been quite thorough in giving everybody the history in the request for decision on everything there. 
Uh, the county has proceeded with a number of improvements to our rural road network with upgrading a number of them to a paved standard. And along with that, we have included the um, upgraded, up, updated signage that goes along with, with that. Um, the locations that remain out there with the AMA rural road signs, uh, they're deteriorated, they're falling apart. We don't have anything more for materials to replace them with unless we go to a new sign standard. Um, I reached out to our colleagues at Alberta Transportation regarding these signs uh, because it was an opportunity for the county to take them over from AMA back in the day, which we agreed to do. Uh, if we're going to keep those signs there, Alberta Transportation through their email would prefer that we upgraded the signage to actually be what we would do um, in today's standards, which would see those removed and double post signs go up in advance of the intersection for wherever the motoring traffic is coming from and uh, have that, you know, that kind of directional signage um, in, the, in those areas which would be along our roadsides rather than in Alberta Transportation's road allowances. So with those things being known um, and the upgrades to paved roads with the improved signage, uh, just the advancements in technology these days that, that many people are running around with uh, GPS in their vehicles. If they're not in their vehicles, they have it in the palm of their hand in a phone or maybe some people are still using uh, mobile GPS units. Uh, I'm not really sure that I see the necessity of these signs remaining in place. And therefore, we provided the recommendation to remove the rest of the signage out there uh, on the basis really that none of the motoring public has, has identified any issues or consigns with damages to those signs or lack thereof and uh, remove them from our responsibility as well, which would see us remove the posts and the signs and move on with uh, our regular activities. So seeking council's approval on that. So Mark, any signs that, um, or the message from AT was basically, if we wanted to replace them, it would be at our cost with, with a different sign. Yeah, replace at our cost and, and as the, the motorist is driving up to the intersection, you see like a couple hundred meters in advance, the big green sign uh, with, with the community or, or wherever you're being directed to. Uh, those signs are going to cost much, much more than what those little green picket signs were. And um, I, we haven't had any calls for lack of signage, you know. We, we've had... Um, We've had nothing in the past decade of, of desire from the motoring public to say we need more signage out there. So anybody have any thoughts on this? Clarence? I move that we remove them. I mean, maybe if the wood's still good, we should have a wiener roast. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Thank you, Clarence. Lionel. I was going to remind, through the chair, I was going to remind Councillor Am Amligan that, that there was a day when we missed a, a turn off. If I remember correctly, <laughs> a time that might have been kind of handy for us. So I'm not totally in favor of getting rid of them. I still, um, I still depend on them somewhat because I don't always drive around with my uh, GPS on. <laughs> well, it's funny because it's made me think about the one that I see a lot which is at the uh, uh, north end of the Duck Lake Road when it hits the 561. And uh, I thought just now, I wonder if we have, I gotta pay, you gotta pay better attention because if you know where you're going, you never look at signs. 
it made me wonder if as you approach that junction, I don't think there's a sign that says Hazar this way and I don't know, Jim, I guess it would be that way or something else. So I'm going to take a look, but I understand that, uh, yeah, people probably aren't using them that often. But they have saved all of us at one time or another. Any other comments? Amory. There's one north of my house to a couple of miles. And um, if you drive by, you can't read them anyway. They're faded. They're not maintained, so I'm in favor of removing them. Any further discussion? Clarence? Just a reminder, uh, I think uh, I know what Councillor Just was referring to, and if, if we had been paying attention and not yakking so much, uh, we probably would have turned where we were supposed to. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to get deeper into this conversation. Um, Brian. Well, I got to add my two bits worth it. What are they? They're just going to shoot up the county signs now instead of these, these uh, motoring signs. <laughs> so, but I support the motion to, to discontinue. All in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion is carried. <laughs> Thank right. you. Thanks, Mark. Um, committee reports. Those are there from last month. Um, the only thing for April I have is that there was a CRC community response um, committee meeting last week, I believe it was, or two weeks ago. And uh, once the minutes for that come out, we can get them forwarded on. It's a big meeting with a lot of people. So I, uh, it's a good meeting for our community and it always reminds me of how, how many organizations we have that work together for us all. It's quite incredible. Any other committee reports? Tracy. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give an update on, uh, we had our uh, Brooks Park and Rec meeting last night and uh, it's, they use a different system and every time it's so hard to get logged in and I can't hear, they can't see me and then all of a sudden it's kicked in. I know Lionel had troubles and he couldn't get on. So he kind of listened on my phone for a while, but it's just crazy. Anyways, um, so they're, they're looking at, uh, just give you some highlights of what come out of that meeting. Um, they are looking at, or they've been working on a 10 year recreation plan. And the document um, has been, I guess, put together and uh, 162 pages or something that's before the steering committee and then um, Lionel and I re requested that it come back before our Parks and Rec uh, meeting before it goes to City Council um, and then they're doing putting together sort of a, a, a board member manual so that when we are applying or um, asking for members at large to sit on this committee that they understand what the committee is actually about. So we're going to do a kind of a one pager um, that sort of you can just hand it to someone that gives you sort of highlights. <coughs> and then out of that discussion last night came um, sort of that the bylaw needs to be reviewed. And the one question that um, because of the ICF agreement, and I guess maybe this could go back to our committee um when we bring back our review list of committees that is that a committee that we um council needs to participate in now um just because it it has its own bylaw it's run by the city it's city facilities um just so food for thought and that was brought up last night too at the rec meeting um and just they touch base on how restrictions 
there's certain facilities that you can rent um, with one-on-one -on -one team, sort of a, you have to have a trainer and one-on-one. -on -one. So they kind of talked about the impacts of COVID and we're still looking for a member at large um, for the county position and uh, elected a new youth um, person last night. So other than that, that's about it for, for that board. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, Clarence and Anne-Marie. We, uh, we did have a uh, FCSS meeting last night where I learned, uh, and it's probably in the bulletin today, or whenever you get your bulletin these days, that uh, Lori Sim is our Citizen of the Year for this year, and Joseph Galaski, who is a student in St. Joe's in grade 12, is the Junior Citizen of the Year. We also approved our audited uh, financial statements for 2020. We did, lead, we did have a bit of a surplus uh, due to a number of things uh, not going forward because of COVID. And uh, one of the more things that really struck me, usually there's about a $7,000 bill for, for um, uh, board members. This year it was a thousand. So there are some pluses to uh, doing everything uh, the way we're doing this meeting today. So we'll be able to replenish uh, and we still haven't we'll vote on it probably next board meeting. We usually keep a thousand, $100,000 um, in reserve in case something drastically goes wrong. A couple of years ago, we spec lost some about $30,000 in funding from the provincial government. And at that time we stepped in and helped them continue those programs that would have had to been cut at that time and uh, so it was down to 70 and that's kind of why we keep the reserve and uh, we'll probably uh, up it again with some of the dollars we were able to save this year uh, not because uh, we wanted to but because of conditions uh, the one thing that we have noticed uh, for the last uh, ever since COVID has hit that uh, food bank costs have been marginally higher and pretty steady higher. Um, and I guess we'll see where that goes over time, but uh, that does take a few more dollars than usual uh, for FCSS. And I also saw, and, and I, I haven't had a chance to really look at it, but the, um, and Sandra actually sent this out that there was a, uh, some legislative changes with gives FCSS a little bit more uh, flexibility to deal with uh, issues that COVID brings on. And one of them is, is to provide, to be able to provide food. We always did it, uh, supported the food bank through our, our uh, municipal dollars that came forth, but it sounds like now that we will also be able to use government dollars. So. There's a few other things in there that allow us more flexibility, relaxes some of the regulations that FCSS is, was traditionally had to follow. So and I'm not sure what they all are, but it's all to deal with the situation we are in today. And that's about it. And I think those, those regulation changes are probably good. I would be very surprised if they weren't uh, something that was uh, you know, make, makes things easier to deal with uh, people that aren't uh, as fortunate as some of us are, that, that dollars have all of a sudden disappeared from jobs and so forth. So anyway, I think it's a good move to give us a little more flexibility. Thanks, Clarence, and I would have to agree with All right, Anne-Marie. Yeah, I had a question for Tracy and, and Lionel about the 10-year um, master plan for the city of Brooks. This morning, we talked about the five-year plan for Bizano and how they have to, had to make an adjustment after one year and asked for about well, 25,000 more from the county. 
Um, now, this 10-year master plan from the City of Brooks, do we have to endorse that too and so make a commitment for 10 years? Is, is that what the thinking behind the endorsement is? Tracy, Actually, Lionel will have to ask. And Lionel will have to take this one on. I haven't, wasn't involved in the steering committee. They just had one of us and uh, we haven't seen the document yet. So I'll turn it over to Lionel. Thanks, no, it's, it's a capital plan for the city and they're um, going forward on, on, on future, future capital. It's not, um, no, there's not a financial commitment on this. You'll read when when we get the document, we'll give it to you, and you can read it over, and you'll you'll understand what it's about. It doesn't have dollars attached to it at all. All right, Matt. Uh, remind council in our updated recreation agreement with the city of Brooks, they did indicate that they would be updating their 10 year capital plan. And it's, it's in our agreement once that has been updated that it will come back in front of council as a whole uh, to look at and consider any changes that they might have to, uh, to pitch to you. So just uh, be looking for it. It's going to be coming back to us to, uh, to review. All right, anything else? Kelly? Um, so Shortgrass Library had our regular meeting yesterday afternoon, and we also approved our financial statements for um, 2020, um, realizing a bit of a, 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 a blue-sided document, which is always good. Um, we uh, approved, um, updated some policies and procedures um, as we do every meeting. And um, a reminder that libraries, although they're closed to the public, uh, they do offer uh, online services and also curbside service. So um, don't count your libraries out um, for people who, um, need materials or want materials, uh, these are still an option. Thank you. Anything else before we move on? All right. Um, post agenda item. Clarence and the rest stop and uh. yeah and, and and my my question basically first of all is have we received any information on the Alberta government's enhancement of the roadside stops uh, on the I think it's mostly on the Trans Canada and I'm not totally sure. Uh, that that's my first question. My second kind of comment on that is, I think we have to be very careful when, if there is enhancement, and I take it it's the what I call the golden teepee uh, between Bizano and Brooks, and I'm thinking it's about that. And some comments being made that it's too close to the city and the people aren't stopping at the city and, and that type of thing. And, and I think we have to be very careful when we, when we talk about that, especially when it's not even in your jurisdiction. Uh, I think we all, we have wonderful cooperation between our municipalities and what's good for, for we, take the attitude what's good for one is good for the other in some way or another. And I certainly think it's good that there's enhancement on the Trans-Canada Highway. And I would hate to be, be the one that makes comments that that isn't going to happen because all of a sudden I'm scared that 
one of my businesses and my municipality is going to be in competition with that. I, I think anything that enhances our area is, is good in the long run. I'd like to point out that when McDonald's looks for a location to put their their restaurants, they usually try to put it beside a Dairy Queen or a Wendy's. And you see that all over the place because it attracts people. And if there's one thing that we need in our area is an attraction of people and we need people. So I, I think um, I think we all have to be very careful when, when we make comments about that. And if there's dollars coming from the provincial government that enhances our area, I would be very, I think we have to have some caution when we start to criticize that. That's all, all I would have to say as far as a comment from the little I know about the project. But I'm, I would like to know if we have any further information on these on these enhancements that seems to be getting papers. Thanks, Clarence. Yeah, that's a good question. I uh, have lear learned about it um not directly from alberta transportation and so i don't know if anybody on our staff got anything mark i'd have to pick ariana's brain because i thought there was an email that came around with something indicating those improvements i just top of my head i i, I can't pinpoint it Ariana, we'll have to go back. Yeah, a lot of emails. Yeah, we, we all do. And, and I certainly know about it, and so I'm thinking that maybe we got a general piece of information, but we certainly didn't get anything specific. I don't believe. Mark. Yeah, no, and, and that's what I recall off of it. And, and I didn't um, give any, shouldn't say any, I, I didn't give much concern to it because we generally don't comment much on, on truck stops along Highway 1 and stuff like that. I know there was the Committee on Veterans Highway, Highway 36, looking to improve truck stops along that corridor and whatnot. Um, some of those improvements have been made um, north of us on some of the highways north of Hannah and whatnot. I don't um, know of anything particularly around here that's advanced or moved forward, but uh, I, I wasn't giving too much regard for that myself, so my apologies. Well, it seems to have gained um, some anti-support from a whole bunch of mayors that I'm assuming it's up number two highway, as well as number the number one and um, I personally believe exactly what Clarence said and I will never forget the for me it was a comment from a fairly infamous entrepreneurial spirit in Bizano who when another restaurant was opening down the street beside him and it was Harry Harry Lee um, said bring on the competition it's good for us all and it's yeah. and it's good for the people we serve so um, I am. <laughs> I think we've all on this council had the uh, opinion that what is good for one municipality is good for us all. You know, it's like uh, when you get sort of uh, you get a phone call from the Calgary Herald all of a sudden about something that's happening in your community that you had knew nothing about, which is fine. Amazon was dealing with Green Gate Power and. Latham uh, to buy some power for to be a good guy in the green business and so to me it's it's all good we support all sorts of energy and economic development and and the roadside stops are just the same like a, a town or city wouldn't say that they don't want another restaurant built in their boundaries because they've already got some I don't think so. I'm I'm a little puzzled, and I have not spoken to any mayors about this, but they've written, been writing letters. I know that. Brian, 
Well, and <clears throat> remind uh, of our, our uh, small uh, meeting with Minister MacGyver last week um, when it was brought up about these roadside things. What was his comment? Well, for every for every phone call or for every um, somebody that wants a, wants a roadside pull out by his community, another one doesn't because it'll be bring too much. Uh, it'll be com competition. So, no, I I bring it on and. Uh, let it, let let it let it happen the way it's supposed to happen. Let's not try to get involved in it too much. Go ahead, Lionel. Well, I, I from a personal point of view, the roadside stops. I I never really had a lot to do with them here locally. But I, the last few years, I've had some escorts to Calgary, and I was amazed at how the people that drove me utilized them. And it was it was very surprising how busy they were. This one on on this side of Bizano, it was it was well used, and that tells me that that's a, a required service then. And also, I do remember another personal encounter, and I I traveled the Autobahn in, in Germany, and they had them there, and they were incredibly beneficial. You know, you can't just get off and go into a into a community in a lot of those areas because it's difficult. And so the roadside, no, I'm I'm very much in favor of. Mark, comment. Yeah, I don't have uh, I don't have the exact reference yet, but I'm starting to think that I read it in uh, one of my paper publications. Yes, we we still receive magazines. Uh, we've done our best to move them electronic, but we do receive some. And uh, I did come across the article about uh, why do many U.S. truck stops offer more amenities, and and some of it speaks to the fact that access for large trucks into some of the urban areas just simply is, is not as convenient as something immediately adjacent to the highway. And um, from what I read in the in the Brooks Bulletin um, about competition with those amenities going towards those truck stops and stuff, it, it's, it's trying to cater to the large trucking industry to give them the things so that they're not um, imposing on more personal passenger vehicles in, in communities and stuff to to get to the services that they need. They need those quick efficient services along the highways that keep them on the road and keep them rolling. Not being drawn into uh, congested areas and trying to navigate their, their large uh, trucks. Sometimes they're pulling dual trailers, right? And um, I think a lot of this is also is playing into the fact that uh, the Canadian government is uh, implementing electronic logging devices for truck drivers. They used to carry uh, paper log books because you have to record how many, how many hours you've been driving, how many hours you've been off shift, uh, how many hours you've slept and things like that. They're making it all electronic. And with that, um, there isn't going to be uh, the ability to uh, carry a dual book and, and kind of... Um, cheat the system on how many hours you've been driving, which is improving those driver's safety for, for everybody on the roadway, right? And and having those amenities roadside where they can get off with ease and stuff it is gonna help uh, alleviate some of that uh, time constraint that's in uh, imposed on them with electronic logging devices as well. So that that's kind of what I can add, uh, I guess, to the argument of keeping some of that stuff out of the, the communities because Anytime you come across a large truck navigating urban roads to get to where the delivery is, it, it impedes or restricts the movement of others at the same time. So that's my general take on it, uh, food for thought, I guess. I'm assuming also that within the County of Newell on number one highway, are they not all for the westbound traffic? No, some of them are eastbound. 
the the one east of Tilly is for eastbound traffic only. The the one oh, yeah. uh, between Brooks and Bazano is for westbound. And and there is there is no way to get from the other side to to that truck stop unless you're turning around in one of the narrow uh, medians, which most of those guys won't won't do. So forgot about the east one, east of Tilly. Yes, Kelly. I just I just wanted to add to the conversation as uh, somebody who has to drive into the cities for services. Um, since COVID has hit, you have to plan your trips much smarter nowadays because of um, for the bathroom breaks, right? Not all facilities um, uh, have open bathrooms anymore for us rural people to to use while we're in town. So um, uh, if if this is something um, that's going to continue in our world, um, this puts the onus on us to to be sanitized going in and sanitized coming out. But um, at least it's our risk and. Uh, the facility is available if we need it. <laughs> good point. Okay, it's good you put that on the agenda, Clarence, because uh, I sort of been wondering about it, but I don't know if that helped. Nobody seems to know a lot, but we, I don't believe, have had any direct contact in regards to it. Okay, moving on in our agenda. Uh, we have our information items, and then we need a motion to move in to camera. 